Good morning, guys. It's um, Matthew 3. Matthew 3 today. This is kind of a short chapter, but I think I could sit here and talk for probably an hour on this stuff. It's a chock full of stuff. Let me watch one timer going. And um, so let's go. Let's just get into it. It's a. Uh, <laughs> Like the top of my head was getting cut off. Uh, Matthew 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we got a bunch of stuff going on <laughs> right off the bat of the first sentence. Uh, in those days came John the Baptist. John the Baptist was uh, the first miracle. Yeah, I could see you could say it was the first miracle for 400 years since um, Malachi. Um, he was born of a, an old older woman, one as old as Sarah, but she was, I think she was past birth age, giving birth age. I think she was like in her 60s, I believe. Um, and he came preaching. He was a cousin, a cousin of Jesus, by the way. He was born shortly before Jesus was born, which is appropriate since he's. One <laughs> going before the king. Anyway, again, he comes preaching in the wilderness. Now, preaching, the word there, preaching is uh, like proclaiming or proclamating. Oh, what's the word? A herald, like a king's herald. A king would issue an edict. And the herald would go to the people, the king, the people uh, that the king was, uh, his subjects, go to his subjects. And he would announce what the edict was. So he was the herald. So when you see preaching, you're this is heralding. You're saying what what God is giving you to say regarding how to do something or or law. I guess would be the word, not not Jewish law, but kind of thing. If you think of it as a, a I have it in my mind as a allegory kind of of a king, a castle, and he's a king in the castle, and he has his heralds, and he and he writes edicts, and he sends them down into the village below for the for the people. So that's how kind of how I think of it. Um, so John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, "Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." Uh, all right, the Judea is the southern part of Israel. It, it was uh, Judah and Benjamin tribes. That's where the Judah and the Benjamin tribes were, and it was uh, the separate country, countries. The countries got divided into two uh, because of Solomon, and it was Israel and there was Judea. And Judea was the southern part of Israel. Now, but at this time, Israel and Judea are back together again. Yes. Um but this, this is just identifying the, the area. And he's saying repent. Now, a lot of people have a wrong idea of what repent is. Repent does not mean stop sinning and start living right. That's <laughs> not, and I love the definition of this, that uh, this thing has. I think it's a Strong's definition. But it means I change my mind. I change the inner man, particularly with reference to acceptance of the will of God instead of rejection. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure so sure about that because it's, I think it's more of a secular word. Uh, but it means the giving up definitely of the courses denoted by the following words it is indicated. So, <laughs> but it's, it's saying you're changing your mind about something important and changing your mind to what the guy is saying repent unto. Um, to make it a very secular a very secular idea of it is, and I don't know why it's, a, it's good. It's a good illustration, I think. But if if you're, let's say you are, uh, there, there's a, you're a guy, and there's a young lady who's captured your attention. You're you're enamored with her, and it's clear that she's not enamored with you, and you you want to move on so you're in a pickle because you're kind of you're infatuated with them and it's hard not to be infatuated with somebody so to repent repent of 
being infatuated with one girl and deciding to be infatuated with some some other girl or something like that, that would be a, re a repentance. Or saying you're going to co stop smoking, that's a, a form of repentance. Not because it's a sin, but because you want to stop doing it. Say you want to start exercising, that's a form of repentance because you start you're going to, your lifestyle is being changed from one lifestyle to another. So repentance means to change your direction of travel. It's it's used a lot in scripture referring to sin, but in this case, it's not really referring to sin. And this is kind of hard to explain, but we'll get into it in a second. Okay, it says, uh, repent ye for the kingdom of his heaven is at hand. Now, John is saying repent because the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. It's, it's arrived. Nobody is uh, enamored with the kingdom of heaven. They've been living their lives. They've been looking for something to coming, but they haven't, they're not living their lives differently because of the kingdom of heaven is coming. And He's saying the kingdom of heaven is coming, so it's time to live differently. So he's talking about repentance. That's what he's repenting. The repentance he's talking about is repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's coming for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This is the, <clears throat> the kind of repentance you're doing. You're, what you're doing is you're, you're getting prepared for the, for Jesus coming, the king is, king is coming, and they don't know who the king is, but they know he's coming. So what they want to do, make the way straight, means to just level out the road, make the road straight and smooth, so when he does get there, you're not going to have a lot of stumbling going on. <laughs> it's, every person has a road. You want to make his the road smooth for changing or transitioning. Now, Matthew was written to the, to the Israelite or to the Hebrew, and the way they handled sin was different than the way that was the sins ha handled in the new kingdom. Sin was handled in the, uh, in the, in Judaism through the sacrificial for animal sacrifice. They sacrificed animals. They would put their hands on the head of a sheep, for instance, and cut the throat. And that was, way you did sin that was and i think that was the way that you did sin for uh something that was unintentional now, i may be wrong there so let's just forget that but so the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord make his path straight and the same john had his raiment of camel's hair now this is kind of weird i think he was doing I, I i was kind of contemplating on why why you would dress so so strangely because the way people dressed back then was the finer they could dress, the better. And this is this guy's wearing a camel's hair, camel's hair clothing. He had a leathern girdle about his loins. Now a girdle was a belt that you put around your your waist and you kept you kept your your money in. John's girdle was about his loins. Now what what they would do when uh they had these long robes and if you had to run somewhere they they got in the way so what they would do is they'd reach down and they'd gather up their robe and pull it up between their legs and hold it up here while they run <clears throat> so kind of making pants out of making pants out of the uh the robe temporarily <laughs> and they call it i forgot what they call that but anyway you're you pulling that pulling that up into the, into your loins and that's the idea here is that the leather girdle is about his loin. So it's not just a belt, but it's more kind of like a, kind of gives me the impression of a, a wrestler's belt, you know, professional wrestlers, the, the belt they wear, but made out of leather. Uh, let's see. And his meat was locusts and wild honey. Locusts uh, are, uh, uh, an insect, of course, and insects are clean food. I've found out. This is from Leviticus eleven twenty two. Even these of them you may eat: the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. So insects were considered food um, in Judaism, and wild honey. Uh, then he went out to Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around 
about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Baptized. We went over repent. Now, baptism, I, did, I went over this also in Mark, Mark chapter 1, if you want to uh, check those out in, in my timeline history. Uh, covered in a lot more detail, but uh, I'm just going to cover it briefly here. Baptism is a way of identification, and it's a way of marking a change in inside you. So it, it's kind of uh, it, it, you identify with what you're being baptized, baptized unto. For instance, now let's say you, you know, for we're talking about the repentance. You can this this is a, a, a baptism of repentance. I'm getting ready to talk about. Let's say this girl that you were had, uh, uh, you're enamored with, um, gets married. Like, uh, you're going to be miserable the rest of your life, st still consumed or uh, by the by following after that. You know, that word keeps escaping me that I used while ago. Uh, what is it? Yeah obsessed you're gonna be you're gonna be bad shape being obsessed the rest of your life or a girl just got married so you could do a baptism of repentance it was a change a baptism of change where you repent you would say okay i'm no no longer going to be chasing this girl i'm going to be chasing somebody else so you do a baptism of repentance what you do is you go into the water enamored with one girl and you come up from the water enamored with the other girl that you do that. You're doing this in your mind saying this is marking the day that you're changing what you're doing. Well, it's the same thing here, <clears throat> but in this case, you're repenting from sin. You're not repenting from chasing one girl and decide to chase another girl. That's probably a bad illustration, but <laughs> I got to go with it now. So it's a, that's a baptism of repentance. You're identifying yourself as what you don't want to be and then what you want to be. Well, it's the same thing here, but for sins. Because the Israelites, they believed, they their, their religion had them um, sacrifice animals for sins. And John was preaching, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So they were changing their, the, the baptism of repentance. They were changing their minds on how they were going to handle sins. They weren't going to handle sins the old way. They're going to handle sins the new way, the way that the, the kingdom of the kingdom of heaven was going to be bringing, which was what Jesus did on the cross. Now they had no idea what that was going to be at the time. They just were looking forward to it because they were preparing the way of the Lord. They were making straight the road. And the way they were doing that was being baptized, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. They were changing their mind on how or changing the way they were going to live on how they were going to deal with sins. Now, it could be that, it, that the person wasn't following the Ju Judaism. They wasn't doing, they weren't doing what they were supposed to when they sinned. They could have been like um, sinners, sinners that weren't concerned about being sinners. And, and that's typically the way we think of it. They were repenting of their sins we think of the baptism as the repenting of their sins. And to some degree, they did too. Because they, they, if you look at historical records, then when, when they were immersed in the water, they, they had the idea that their sins were, were, were washing off of them and floating downstream. And they had to do it in what they called living water, which is water that was flowing, not, not water that was just sitting there. Because if you got baptized in, in sitting water, this is the way they thought, that when they went into the water, the sins came off, but when they got back out of the water, the sins got back on them again, if they were not in living water. So <laughs> it's a lot. So anyway, baptism. So baptism has a, is a way of identifying with something new. And the word baptism means to immerse, uh, baptize, there's two two different words for baptizing. Baptizing. There's baptizo and bapto. 
to just go over it really briefly. Baptizo, bapto means to dip in water. Baptizo means to immerse into a, a medium until you take on the qualities of that medium. So that would be like dyeing, dyeing a cloth, pickling a cucumber, making uh, corned beef out of uh, beef brisket. It's all kinds of different ways of baptizing it. Uh, crumb plating a crumb plating a grill would be baptizing. It goes in without the chrome, comes out with the chrome. I watch this fifteen minutes. Uh, okay, so so he was b baptized, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Uh, you remember the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were the kind of uh, the hoity-toities. There was the Pharisees that were on the right and the Sadducees that were on the left. They were both kind of on the, in the wealthy class. They both dressed pretty well, and they both depended on, um, well, Pharisees depended on Judaism. Um the Sadducees were trying to change that. Uh, but he calls them vipers. Now, a viper, I'm not sure that this is true, but they believed this back then. They believed that once a, a male viper mated with a female viper, the female vi viper would bite the head off of the male viper. And then when a viper didn't lay eggs, a viper had babies, live babies. And when the babies were ready to be born, <laughs> they wouldn't wait to be born like you would normally think it, they would eat their way out and they would kill the mother. So these, a, a viper was co considered an, an unclean animal and it was basically the, the lowest thing that you could be called. It was worse than pond scum to be called a viper. So he's being pretty, pretty bold here. And he says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now the wrath to come is the wrath of God at the end of the age, but there's also the wrath that happens during the tribulation. You can, uh, if you read Revelation, you'll see, you'll read about the wrath of God being mentioned in the tribulation area about 12 times. And um, so what, what John is saying here is that what is about to happen will save you from that wrath. Now, this is a very good argument for pre-trib rapture or we won't get into but because Jesus saves us from the wrath to come you can see this in uh, Romans 5 9 it says much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him uh, let's see we get another one here and this is first Thessalonians 1 10 and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So the wrath to come is the tribulation and the, the final judgment. Let's got one more. Let's check that out. Uh, John three thirty six. He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So what's coming was a way of escaping wrath. And since the tribulation, seven years of tribulation is bringing wrath, then we should be saved from that also, since Jesus is the one that saves us from wrath. And that's about all I'm going to do on that one. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. He's saying this to the, to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. What are fruits, meat for repentance? Well, it's not showing up in your robes and just watching baptism. It would be showing up and being truly repentant repentant, giving, setting aside the law for dealing with sins and baptize, getting baptized for how to handle the sins for the, in the com coming kingdom. They're not doing it. They're down there just taking notes and checking it out. That's one reason he's just talking to them. So he's kind of being sarcastic to them. He says, who has warned you to flee the coming wrath? Uh, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance, and think not to your say, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. 
For I say to you that God is able to raise, to, is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, why would he say that? He, he was saying that because Abraham was given a promise by God that he was going to be the father of many nations. So uh, people who were blood relatives to Abraham, especially the Jews, because the Jews were the ones of the promise, believed that they were saved by being related to Abraham. <laughs> so they were going, we don't need to, we don't need to handle, we don't need to worry about the kingdom of coming because we're children of Abraham. <laughs> we don't have to worry about this. And, and uh, he's responding by saying that God is able to raise stones for Abraham because Abraham has the promise of being the, the father of many nations, multitudes. Um, so he's saying, hey, God can wipe you all out and raise stones up for children for Abraham. So don't, don't let that <laughs> make you think you're something special. And now also the ax is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now this, uh, I got a little different twist on this or different understanding than, than your standard understanding. Your standard understanding is the trees are, are people. And if you don't bring good fruit, you're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. And to some degree that is true. We'll get into that in a minute. But that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is religion. <laughs> he's, he's talking about the different religions, that there are different ways of living. And he's saying the, the, all the ways of living, each way of living is a tree. Let's say Judaism is, a, is or, yeah, Judaism, no. Abraham is a tree. And you can read about that in Romans 11 where he is considered a, a, an olive tree. So it's, he's saying that the ax is being laid to the root of all the trees that had to do with how, how to get saved, how to, and how to bring, if it doesn't bring forth fruit, it's going to be cut down. <laughs> There's only one tree that didn't get cut down, that doesn't get cut down, and that's Abraham. And we are seeds of Abraham. We are grafted into the olive tree. You can read more about that in Romans 11. Uh, so he's, he's telling these guys that if you're practicing a religion, in this case is, well, I guess you could consider Judaism a religion. A Judaism is, uh, part of Abraham, but Abraham was not the law. Judaism had the law. So he's, he's telling these guys that the, uh, Old covenant isn't the way, it's the new covenant that's coming that's the way. So I kind of botched that pretty good, but let's go on anyway. Um, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So every tree that doesn't get you saved is getting cut down. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I that baptized you with water unto repentance. You could read about that in Mark uh, 1, 1, 4, where it's worded differently. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I kind of went over that a while ago. A baptism of repentance. I, I explained that on how sins are forgiven is basically what the phrase means. Baptism of repentance on how sins are forgiven. Are forgiven. So the changing your way of how you believe sin should be taken care of. The old way, animal sacrifice, the new way, they don't really know, but they're being baptized unto it. They're looking forward to it. But he that cometh after me, uh, see, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that come after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So you're going to be baptized. Jesus, is, he's immersing people in water. Jesus is going to be immersing the one that was coming after him, which is Jesus, is going to be immersing everybody in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Now, what does that mean with fire? Because a, a lot of the Pentecostals, some Pentecostal types think 
being uh, baptized with fire means you're getting the what's left of your old nature burned out of you, and it's an experience that you go through, and it's very painful. And when you come out of it, you're a lot you're a lot better off. Uh, you're walking more in the spirit. You're you're you're. The idea there is that the 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 draw of the flesh has been been burned out, and uh, that's not what this means here. I'm though I don't doubt. I have little doubt, let's put it that way, that what they experienced is something that they experienced, but it was because of faith that they experienced it, not because of this verse. It was faith and a misunderstanding of this verse, which is which is fine. But you can find out, you can see that, that what what I'm saying is true in the in the, final, in the following verses. I baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. Now, the idea here is there a threshing floor for wheat. Now, what you would do with wheat is you would lay it on the threshing floor, and you would have an ox that would walk around, and he would be pulling a sled that would be breaking the wheat away from the chaff. And then what they would do is take take the, uh, uh, take the a, a, some kind of fork, type of thing and throw it up in the air on a windy day and the wind would blow the, sh the chaff away and the uh, the kernels, what do they call them? Wheat berries. <laughs> the wheat berries would fall back to the ground. So eventually you had nothing but, but wheat berries around. Now if you didn't have a wind, you had a fan and you would blow it with a fan. So <clears throat> uh, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor meaning he's, he's going to get separate the chaff from the wheat and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So that is explaining what's going on with the baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. You will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. That happens in uh, Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit is poured out on flesh. And the Holy Spirit is poured out on everybody to convict us of sin if we don't believe in Jesus. He's always trying to convict us of sin when we don't believe in Jesus until we do believe in Jesus and then convict us of righteousness once we are born again and then convict us of judgment to come. Uh, I'll put the scripture verse in there for that. So that's, that's half an hour there. And we're almost done. Um... And then there's also the miraculous stuff, part of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let's read that scripture verse here. Uh, baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost. If that's right. Yeah, Joel. This is Joel 2.28. This is the, the verse that uh, Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And there's some other stuff in there, too. Y'all can read. Well, let's see. Let's jump to that reference. See if there's anything else. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. This is this part hadn't happened yet. The, Everything up until verse 29 has happened. And I'll show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. That's stuff that's coming in the, in the judgment that's coming up. Okay. I covered that. The baptism and fire, that's, that's where the lost go at the end. <clears throat> then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John, John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened up unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, why was Jesus baptized? He wasn't changing the way he was, he was believing regarding sin. 
His baptism was not a baptism of repentance. Baptism of repentance. for the, Yeah. His, his baptism wasn't a baptism of repentance. He wasn't changing his mind about anything. His baptism was being identified with, with man. So just as a white cloth being dipped in a red dye it comes out of red cloth, and that's what he was doing. He was he was going in to be baptized into man. And this is Isaiah fifty three twelve. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So his baptism wasn't a baptism of repentance, but a baptism of identification with man. And I'd like to think he did it. He uh, uh, did it downstream from where everybody else is. Everybody else was being baptized, and their sins were sins were floating off. My ditto's going. Their sins were floating off, and he was baptized downstream where the sins were. He picked up the sins of everybody. <laughs> That's. That's not biblical. That's just me hypothesizing. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, Matthew chapter three. Next time, Matthew chapter four. See you guys.